Uh, okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about, yes, modeling interstellar shocks. And it's, uh, it's quite a very rich topic. So I have, a, it's going to be a dense presentation, but uh, yes, yeah, I will first start with a, oops, this way. Okay, uh, so I'll first start with a, a theoretical part and then I will talk about uh, modeling comparison to observations. So first, very, um, very basic uh, reminders about shock theory, but basically this lecture is all the things I would have liked to know about shocks when I started, uh, all the basic stuff. So uh, this is a, a nice drawing, I think, that uh, illustrates uh, how a shockwave forms. Uh, it's an image of uh, skiers going up and down the slope in, uh, let's say, a foggy, foggy day, and they, they don't see the, the tree. And as uh, skiers pile up, you can see that the shock wave is, is, is flowing back into the flow. So this is called a reverse shock. Uh, and it happens when, for example, a stellar wind hits a wall, uh, a very dense obstacle. And what happens is that there is a sudden compression. Uh, and because of mass conservation, uh, when the density increases, the velocity has to drop. Uh, so everything stops. And uh, there is a conversion of the ki incoming kinetic energy flux into uh, other types of energies, thermal energy, heat, uh, dissociation, if you have molecules, ionization, uh, magnetic energy, if the, if the medium is magnetized, then you also need to compress the magnetic field. Uh, because of flux freezing. So that requires also some energy. And then internal energy of the, of the atoms and molecules, and that is what is producing the, the cooling radiation. And that's what we're interested in because that's our only way to observe uh, these shocks. So first, uh, in reality, we have no wall, uh, but usually in the ISM, we have a compressible obstacle, like an ambient cloud or previous uh, wind ejecta from you know, previous episodes. So in that case, what happens is that there is also a shock front running into the obstacle and compressing the obstacle uh, to resist against uh, the, the incoming uh, piston or wind. And in between those two shocks, uh, you have what we call a contact discontinuity. Okay, so in general, there will be two shocks. Uh, now, this is um, just uh, to give you an idea of how these shocks uh, evolve in time. For example, for a supernova remnant, uh, which is a, a very powerful shock, of course, in the ISM, you have several phases depending on the cooling of these shocks. Uh, because initially the, the stellar ejects are extremely fast. And so the sh they, 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 they run, they get a very fast shock. And these fast shocks um, heat so much the gas that it doesn't cool very rapidly. So very quickly you build, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, my mouse, but uh, when there is this reverse shock that we just talked about, uh, the eject are heated to extremely high temperature and they become a almost a fireball. And also the uh, interstellar gas is also heated to very high temperature. So there is a phase called the set of Taylor phase where everything is super hot and there is almost no, no radiative cooling loss. And you can solve for the expansion analytically. Then eventually the uh, interstellar gas uh, manages to cool down because it's denser and also the, the, the expansion slows down. So the shock uh, becomes uh, less and less strong and, and cools more rapidly. So you have a shell of dense gas that forms, and it's typically the old supernova phase. And uh, then there is also a stellar wind bubbles, which is a very common example of shocks in the interstellar medium. That's when you have, for example, a, a massive star with a very fast wind uh, shocking against uh, the ambient medium. So it looks a bit like this uh, first uh, supernova remnant phase, except that the interstellar gas is cooler because it's, it's a slower shock. And if the wind is slow, uh, and that is what, what I've been working on mostly, uh, and we work on when we do protostellar jets, for example, the wind is slow enough that it also cools. So both shocks are highly radiative. They compress a lot because the, the temperature is low. So to, to, to maintain pressure, they have to have a very high density. 
Um, and so you have a very thin shell. And in that case, the, the shock is driven outwards, not at all by thermal pressure, but just by the ram pressure of the wind. And this is what is called, uh, you, you may see this in papers, it's called the snowplow phase. It took me a long time to understand what that meant. So I, I'm happy to share that uh, understanding with you. Uh, and it's, and it's, uh, it's an easy, it's a nice phase because it's relatively easy to solve for the expansion of the shell in that, in that phase. In that phase, in fact, what just uh, if you look at the, the shell mass increase and the momentum increase from the shock to wind, so from just from the ram pressure of the wind, you can solve these two equations to get the evolution of the shell speed. And in fact, because of the shape of this equation, uh, Vs, the shell speed tends to uh, reach uh, this, this value, which is basically when these two terms are equal. Uh, so it adapts uh, as a function of expansion so that it's always close to this equilibrium, which is the, the ram pressure equilibrium between the two shocks. And so what is important to see is that when the ambient uh, density rho A is much larger than the wind density rho wind, the, the velocity at which the shell expands is much slower than the wind speed. So uh, the wind is going to have very strong deceleration. Let's say your wind is 100 and uh, Vs is 10. The wind is going to slow down a lot. But uh, the ambient medium is going to suffer a more mild shock. It's going to feel uh, an increase of velocity of Vs. It's going to feel the shell coming at Vs, so 10 kilometers per second. So we're going to have two shocks at quite different speeds. Um, now, for the shock modeling, how do we model shocks? There, there are two kinds of modeling, and uh, there is what we call forward modeling, which is just uh, what I just did, which is to specify a driving piston, some agent like a wind or a supernova explosion, and to specify the ambient medium conditions. And then you can compute the shock front uh, propagation, its structure, uh, its cooling, its thickness, the emitted spectrum. And then there is also what, uh, a, an inversion, another what we call shock modeling can also be a backwards modeling. Namely, we observe some emission fluxes from a shock and we try to do the opposite. From that, we try to fit shock parameters and to recover the piston properties. For example, we'd like to know what was the wind mass flux or momentum flux or power uh, that produced the shock. We want to maybe to constrain the ambient medium properties also, that can be uh, using uh, you know, the shock properties. We can learn things about the magnetic field in the ambient gas, its density, its ice composition, uh, which is all very interesting uh, in its own sake. And then we can also want to constrain, to use these shock observations to constrain the global feedback of shocks on the ISM. For example, for the turbulent support of clouds, for the chemistry of the interstellar medium, for star formation regulation. All of these questions uh, require to do some kind of inversion from the observations. So I'm first going to discuss the forward modeling. What are all the ingredients that enter into these shock models? Because then it's very important if you want to use them then for backwards modeling, it's very important to know uh, which are the ingredients, which are the assumptions, which are the limits of these models um, before you, you use them. So in terms of forward modeling, that also branches into two kinds. Basically, there is semi-analytical work and numerical simulations. So they, each of them, they have their advantages and they have their limitations. So the semi-analytical models, they are only 1D planar shocks in steady state. That is very idealized, but the, the good thing is that you can include, they're very fast to compute. So first you can compute large model grids. You can include very complete non-equilibrium microphysics, like you know, ionization, chemistry, grains, ion neutral drift, whatever. You can also even try to do 2D by collections of 1D shocks. And I will show you an example of that later. 
And the limit, of course, is that uh, even when you do pseudo 2D, you ignore the loss of pressure that can happen on the sides of, of your shock. Uh, if it's not an infinite uh, sheet, but it, it has edges or curvature, there's going to be a change of pressure uh, along, the, along the, the, the shock. And also, of course, you ignore all of the time dependent effects and instabilities that can form in, in 2D or 3D. For the numerical simulations, uh, it's the opposite. I mean, the, the, the nice uh, the advantages are that you have the exact time dependence. So you can have like a time variable jet or a time variable wind. You can study the instabilities and turbulence that can develop at, at the rear of the shock. You can uh, also treat the curvature uh, accurately, but uh, the problem, the limitation is the CPU cost. Um, usually you have to use a simplified cooling and chemistry because otherwise it becomes prohibitive. Uh, it's very challenging to resolve the cooling length if you have a, a dense shock uh, or to treat multi-fluid MHD. We're going to see that later when you have ions and neutrals that are decoupled. Um, you have extra waves that you have to take into account that is very numerically challenging. And also, uh, usually the cooling length is much smaller than the size of your system. So you would need, of course, AMR and a high level of AMR. And even with that, it's, it's pretty hard to do. And of course, you cannot do large grids. So I'm going from now on, I'm going to talk more about the 1D approach, uh, which is the one that includes the most physics and, and chemistry and the, the, the public models that you have access to uh, relatively easily and the grids of models that you can use. So first, it's important to understand what is solved, how we calculate these shock models. In principle, it's very easy. You just express conservation, conservation laws in the frame of the shock wave. That's very important. That's where everything is conserved. Um, so uh, let's consider just a single fluid uh, you know, the simplest case, single fluid magnetic field is parallel to the shock front. So it's compressed like a, like a spring, basically. You just choop, squeeze it in the shock. And then you just write mass conservation, rho v constant, magnetic flux conservation, which is just, uh, you know, as you compress the gas, you also compress the magnetic field line. So they're proportional. Uh, momentum conservation, which involves three terms, the RAM pressure of the, of the fluid, rho v squared, the thermal pressure, P, and the magnetic pressure, B squared over 8 pi, and the sum of that must remain constant um, in a steady shock. Uh, and then the energy conservation, which is a, a little bit more tricky because you have, okay, you have the kinetic energy flux, the uh, pressure, and... Um, and also you have the internal energy uh, of the gas that adds up. And also there is a, a radiative loss. So you have to, to also take that into account in your, in your sum of, of, of energy terms. You have to keep track of that. Uh, and then you can formulate, uh, formulate the conservation in this fashion. Um, there is an even more complicated expressions when B is not parallel to the shock front, but uh, oblique. So I'll save this, you, you can have a look if you're interested. Well, the interesting thing when uh, you have these conservation laws is that you can compute jump conditions uh, in the case where there is a, a very fast uh, transition, like uh, the skiers that I showed you. Uh, if you can assume that uh, the gas goes through the shock sufficient, the, the, undergoes the, the, the shock front is adiabatic. There is uh, no time to radiate anything. You can set F rad equals zero. And uh, you can express U just as the, the uh, gamma, gamma minus, uh, uh, how does it go? Uh, I don't remember if it's gamma minus one. Oh yeah, P over gamma minus one. Uh, in the pre-shock. And then you can uh, solve for uh, this conservation. You, you write it on the, on, on the pre-shock gas and on the post-shock, just on either side of the discontinuity. And you can solve that for the ratio, for example, of density. 
uh, right after the shock as a function of gamma, uh, the, um, uh, the gamma of your gas and M, which is the, the Mach number. So the ratio of the velocity uh, of the incoming gas in the frame of the shock and uh, the sound speed of, in the pressure gas. And so you can see that uh, in the strong shock limit, which is when the Mach number is very large, this tends to constant, gamma plus one over gamma minus one, which is about four for, um, for a monoatomic gas. And those who do the hands-on with, with me and, and Cham, they have noticed this in the J-shocks, you know, we have noticed that the density jumps by a factor of four initially. You can also do obtain from that the ratio of the temperatures in the post shock in the immediate, uh, just on the other side of the jump of the, of the front to the initial temperature, which is a complex equation. But again, uh, if M is much greater than one, and I apologize, the notations are slightly different here, but it's the same M. Um, so if you take big M, this M much greater than one, you find uh, this expression actually. Um, and so uh, typically for a, a shock at, so you see it goes as the square of the velocity uh, because it, it's, it's basically a, a conversion from the kinetic energy into thermal energy. So uh, from V squared, you go to KT basically. Uh, and so to give you an idea, at 10 kilometers per second, it's a few thousand degrees, but at 100, it's already uh, three times 10 to the five. So it goes very, very fast. Uh, now, these are just uh, jump conditions, but it, it doesn't tell you what happens afterwards when the gas starts to radiate. If it doesn't radiate at all, it stays like that and nothing happens. It just stays compressed by a factor of four. It just stays at this temperature forever. Um, but in fact, we have some cooling. So what uh, to solve for the cooling uh, part of the, of the shock, we start from initial, initial conditions, either just before or just after the jump. And then we solve uh, these conditions, these conservation laws, we express them uh, as differential equations uh, along Z. Um, and we solve for the variation of the density, the velocity, the pressure, uh, and for U and, and F rep. So you can see that the derivative of the radiative flux versus Z is just the cooling rate per unit volume. And you see that you are, this, this depends on temperature. So you need to know, uh, for the temperature, you need to know the mean, uh, mean weight, uh, particle weight, convert pressure into temperature. So if we were at equilibrium in the gas, um, all of these quantities, lambda, uh, the internal energy U and mu depend only on the density and the temperature and the elemental resonances. And that's it. Let's say you're in an H2 region. Uh, if you know the density, the temperature, you, the elemental abundances, you can, you know, you can calculate uh, the ionization stages, you can calculate uh, how much is ionized, how much is neutral, you can calculate the cooling, and then you can integrate the equations uh, quite, uh, quite easily because lambda is just a, lambda u and u only depend on, this, on these two uh, quantities. But in, in fact, in shocks, uh, usually um, the rho and t vary too fast for the, for the, the abundances and the excitation and the ionization to follow, to be at equilibrium. So um, they have, don't, don't have time to adjust. So in fact, what we also need to solve along Z, uh, the variation of abundance and ionization stage of each species, uh, and also the, the level of populations if you want to be really uh, super accurate. Uh, although in general, the level populations follow more rapidly, but. Uh, uh, so this adds a lot of equations, you know, basically as many equations as you have species in your shock. <laughs> so it can become pretty heavy. This is just an illustration of how energy is converted in two different kinds of shock that I will describe later on. But just, just to show you that if you don't have magnetic field, uh, 
uh, how things go, first thermal and a bit of internal and then eventually radiation. If you have magnetic field, part of the energy is stored in magnetic compression and, and stays in magnetic compression, so you radiate a bit less. Um, and this is a continuous C shock that we will see later on. So just, just to show you that depending on the type of shock, this conversion is very different. And you really have to solve for the whole structure properly to know uh, where it is radiated, how much it is radiated. Um, another complexity is that uh, in, in ionizing shocks, there are some UV photons emitted in the shock front that can propagate upstream in the pre-shock medium. Uh, it's called a radiative precursor, and um, uh, it's called a radiative precursor, and you can compute, I mean, there's been very detailed calculations, for example, by Sutherland and Dopita, for the atomic case by Hollenbach and Mackey for molecular pre-shock uh, as a function of velocity to see when uh, this precursor starts to modify the pre-shock uh, composition, the pre-shock uh, mu uh, molecular weight. So basically below 40 kilometers per second, there is no effect. And uh, this is a regime where we can, uh, we can ignore the, the, the feedback of the shock on the pre-shock. But for higher velocities, there is an effect. And so you need basically to, to, to iterate, uh, solve for your shock, solve for the UV photons, propagate upstream, modify the pre-shock, run the shock again until it converges. Um, so there are, there are, based on that, there are basically three uh, families of 1D shock models uh, that are as considered as reference. Uh, the first one is for atomic shocks, no molecules, but it's going to very high speed. And it's the mappings uh, series of, of, of uh, code models by Sutherland and Dopita. And there is, uh, it's publicly available on the web. Um, so it's, it's really well adapted to like supernova shocks or maybe AG, AGNs. Um, there, are, there is also a different code by Hartigan, but quite similar, Hartigan and Raymond, but they, uh, uh, that is more optimized for um, jets, uh, stellar jets. Uh, and then there is the, the range of intermediate velocities, I mean, the same range, but the lower range of this, where they consider molecule reformation in the post shock. So I'm going to, to show you what that looks like, but uh, here they assume there is no molecules nowhere. Here, um, the gas dissociates the pre-shock, but then in the post-shock, it can reform molecules. And that changes a lot uh, the predicted, uh, of course, predicted emission at low temperature uh, compared to having no, no molecules. And then there is a third family, which is for the, the ones with no radiative precursor uh, and that are non-dissociative. So the molecules in the pre-shock uh, survive at least partly uh, through the shock front. And they, they really, uh, the, the pre-shock composition has a strong effect on the post-shock emission, which is it's not the case here because you destroy all the pre-shock uh, molecules. So the, this is the Paris-Durham shock code that I will uh, talk uh, a lot in this presentation because first it's the one I know best. And uh, also it, it, it is very rich in microphysics. So it's showing you the, the degrees of complexities that uh, are present uh, in, in these shocks. Um, and they are the ones that are expected to, to emit uh, these two, uh, to emit the most strongly in H2 lines, for example. So this is just uh, to show you a uh, copy of the, of the, um, the page for the mappings uh, five for those who want to run very fast atomic shocks. And just uh, an idea to give you an idea of what are the main coolants in that case at very high temperature. Uh, this is log T, so super high temperature, there's just free free. I mean, everything is ionized, all the atoms are ionized, so you become dominated by free free. And then at lower temperature, you have iron, silicon, neon. Oxygen and carbon, of course, are the, the really dominant ones, and then hydrogen at lower temperature. But you also have very important uh, signatures in these uh, uh, silicon, iron, neon, 
And uh, the problem is that uh, several of these species are on silicon uh, to a less degree carbon and oxygen, but iron and silicon definitely are supposed to be partly depleted in the grain. So you need to, to know how, many, how much dust grains you have in your shelf. Um, now the second family, uh, the dissociative shocks with molecular reformation. So the, I really uh, encourage you to look at this paper if you are interested in this regime. So between uh, 30 and, uh, and 120 kilometers per second. Um, running to uh, whatever medium. So you have uh, UV production in the shock. You have the zone that where this UV gas is, UV photons are reabsorbed. So it's like a small H2 region inside of the shock where you emit a lot of uh, hydrogen mines and low excitation ionic mines. And then there is this region where molecule reformation happens. And it's, it's, it's a plateau because each H2 molecule, when it reforms, releases uh, 4.5 EV of energy. So the, there's like a thermostat. Um, it, it prevents the, the, the gas from cooling until all of, of H is turned into H2 and then it cools by H2 molecules and other molecules. So H2CO, H2O, whatever molecules you can form in this region. Um, this is just uh, an illustration of the shock speed diagnostics in these dissociative shocks uh, at low velo moderate velocities, just to show you the, for example, the neon that we talked about. These are lines, a lot of these lines will be accessible by, no, not all of them. A few of them would be accessible by JWST. Uh, the neon two, for example, is a very good uh, velocity diagnostic. Uh, there will be oxygen four, which is also a very good uh, velocity diagnostic. And then this iron two line, which will uh, probably be quite strong I and mean, depending on the depletion of course. Uh, now I'm going to the, the last uh, family of shock models, the non-dissociative shock models and the reference code, public code that you can use for this is the Paris Durham shock code that is available on the platform, ISM service platform at uh, Observatoire de Paris. Uh, I put the web uh, site in the earlier slide. So uh, you can download the code, you can and run it on your computer, you can have access to a documentation, a quick, uh, quick start guide and, and a more uh, substantial tutorial and uh, access to the basic references and papers uh, on, on this code. And the main um, the main aspect uh, that is, is uh, specific to this regime. Uh, so it, it's made for a molecular medium, of course, uh, molecular ISM, and it's also uh, relatively low speed. So you, the effect of uh, magnetic fields become more, um, more um, substantial than when you are at high shot speeds. Um, so first, uh, there are two very important velocities that, that uh, affect uh, the results. The first one is the alpha speed in the neutrals. So this is the definition of the alpha speed. And uh, you can also uh, parameterize it with this little B parameter here, which is uh, uh, a usual way where we parameterize the magnetic field because in the interstellar medium, uh, B, uh, big B is roughly a square root of rho. So a little b of order one is what we have in molecular clouds. Although in a massive star forming regions, it can be up to three, five, ten. Maybe. And then you can define the alpha and Mach number of your shock, like we did the sonic Mach number. You can do the ratio of the shock speed to alpha speed. And you can, uh, by doing the, you can do the the conservation of, of momentum and uh, and conservation of momentum and mass uh, and 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 magnetic flux gives you the maximum compression uh, in the post shock gas that you can reach when you have a magnetic field and eventually you become dominated by the magnetic pressure because the gas cools down so the thermal pressure drops 
uh, the density increases, so the velocity drops by mass conservation. So also the ramp pressure drops. So eventually in the end, there's just magnetic pressure. Um, and if you, you say that the magnetic pressure in the end is equal to the initial ramp pressure, you find uh, this compression factor. And you can see that uh, you can only have shock compression, which means C greater than one, if the alpha and Mach number is greater than one. So if you, if you, if you are below the alpha and Mach number, you will not manage to compress the gas and you won't have a shock. Um, the other very important quantity is the magnetosonic speed in the charge fluid. So what is the magnetosonic speed? Uh, it's the speed of uh, compressive waves perpendicular to the magnetic field. So it's basically the speed at which if you take a spring, a magnetic spring, and you, you compress it, uh, and then you, you let it expand, re-expand, at which velocity it's going to re-expand. It depends on the density of the ionic fluid, which is rho i here, the charge fluid. Uh, it includes ions and grains, actually. Um, and if, um, if this uh, magnetosonic speed, so if the gas is not very much charged, so rho i is much less than the rho total, uh, it means V magnet can be larger than V advent. So if you compare those two, uh, those two formulae. And so you can have some shocks that are in between those two, those two velocities. So when that happens, it means that there is a compression wave uh, propagating that can propagate faster than the shock. And so it can propagate ahead of the shock in the pre-shock charge fluid. And that's called a magnetic precursor. So what happens to the charges? Um, initially, everything is like the steers. Everything is squeezed against the, the tree. But then the magnetic field reacts by decompressing like a spring, you know, and then the, the, so the ions are bounced off and they, they, they stream through the neutrals until uh, they are in equilibrium between uh, the spring that wants to push them, push them back and the neutrals that are streaming through the ions that want to compress the spring. So in a way, you can, uh, you can reach some kind of equilibrium uh, where the ions slow down uh, because they are attached to the, to the magnetic uh, spring. So they slow down gradually. For them, it's not a shock because they have a wave that is faster than the shock speed. So they are ahead of the shock. They already know that there is a perturbation coming. Uh, they feel that, that the spring is being compressed, and so they slow down. They also compress. As the field line is compressed, the ions are compressed, pre-compressed. And then if the, if the neutrals uh, collide with the ions, and they also start to slow down um, by this, these collisions with the ions. And eventually, if they manage to slow down early enough uh, before reaching the tree, then they don't, uh, they don't undergo shock either. So the whole question is whether they encounter enough ions before reaching the tree or not. So this is uh, an illustration of, of the comparison of the structure of the shocks between those two extreme cases. The left is the, the usual uh, hydrodynamical shock where there is a sudden jump, uh, so supersonic shock, um, temperature proportional to V squared. Here, the dissipation of the kinetic energy, you can see that it's the heating occurs in a very thin layer that is basically the mean free path of the neutrals. Uh, and then it cools down. That's when V is greater than V magnet. Oh, here I forgot, V crit is V magnet. I forgot to change that. Now, if we are below this critical velocity, uh, the ions, uh, you can see that the ions start to slow down gradually, and the neutrals also slow down gradually because they collide with, with ions. And eventually, they manage to 
go and recouple and reach the, the final compression without uh, encountering any jump. So that's what we call a continuous shock uh, and or C shock. Uh, this is for a little b of one. And on the left, it's a little b of 0.1. So when you increase the magnetic field, it helps, of course, because the magnetosonic speed increases, the ions are, are compressed sooner, the neutrals have more time to slow down. But then note the scale here. It's, it's much wider. It's a few 10 to the 16 centimeters instead of a few 10 to the 14 centimeter on the left. And this is much wider because it's the mean free path of the neutrals through the ions and not through other neutrals. Uh, I'm sure this is not very easy to understand for most of you, but uh, we can, I can answer questions about that uh, later on. Um, oh, I forgot to say something else very important is that you can see the maximum temperature on the right axis here is much lower. This is a T, I don't know why the top bar of T is missing, but this is a T. So you see here, it's only a few thousand uh, Kelvin instead of a few 10 to the four Kelvin on the left. And that is because basically there is the same amount of energy to get kinetic energy to dissipate, but you can dissipate it over a much larger volume. So you can, uh, so you don't uh, heat up the gas uh, to the same, uh, you don't need to heat it up to the same uh, uh, temperature uh, immediately. You do it progressively and during the same time, you also cool the gas. So you never reach a very high temperature. Here you first heat it up and then you cool. Here you heat and cool at the same time. So you, you, you never reach very high temperatures. Um, and one of the effects is that uh, on the left, you will start to dissociate molecules at uh, about 30 kilometers per second, but on the right, you will not dissociate molecules. Um, an extra complexity, uh, though, in these sea shocks is that uh, they are very wide, but also they're, they take a long time for the gas to go through the, the structure. So this is showing you basically uh, as a function of time instead of Z, you see that to go through the shock uh, and to, to slow down, it takes 10 to the four years, which is very long. So uh, what happens if you have a young shock, like in protostars, you have you know, ejection of, of, of new jet uh, eruptions every thousand years or 500 years. Um, the precursor doesn't uh, have time to, 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 to expand to its full size. Uh, so what happens is that the, the, the precursor grows, but then uh, it cannot grow, uh, you know, it grows at a certain speed and it cannot uh, uh, exceed a certain thickness after the edge of, of your shock. And behind that, there is, a, a J shock form that is still uh, remaining. So, uh, as time evolves, uh, the precursor grows. The discontinuity at the back uh, that the, the neutrals is, uh, felt initially uh, disappears and, and, and gradually, uh, gradually disappears. And it's only after uh, a certain amount of time that uh, we, we recover the, the full steady structure. The good thing is that if you do numerical simulations of, of these time dependent shocks, and if you compare to the steady models, you see that you can pretty well reproduce the simulations by just sticking together a steady C shock, a truncated steady C shock, and a truncated J shock model. So uh, we can actually mimic uh, young, young shocks, young C shocks with a steady shock model just by manually truncating it. Uh, and that's a free parameter also in the Paris Durham shock model. And we call these shocks CJ shocks because they have a C uh, precursor 
and then there is a J-shock front uh, discontinuity still embedded in it. Um, another ingredient that is quite important to, to note uh, in these uh, non-dissociative uh, shocks, C-shocks and J-shocks, uh, is the effect of grains. So, uh, of course, there is the depletion of, of refractory elements, but there, is also, uh, there are also two other effects. Uh, the first one is that, uh, as uh, I showed you, the magnetic uh, magnetosonic speed depends on the inertia of the charged fluid. And in fact, the grains uh, dominate this inertia for a gas to dust ratio of, uh, of 100, typical of the ISM. It's the grains that dominate. And uh, pretty much regardless of the, uh, of the irrigation conditions. So um, if the ratio of, of mass is 100, the ratio of velocities, which is uh, one of our square root of rho is, is 10. So you see that uh, this magnetosonic speed is typically about 20 kilometers per second times this uh, magnetic parameter, which is uh, of order one for the general ISM. So, Sea shocks cannot be very fast. I mean, it's a limit of about 20 kilometers per second. Um, the other effect of grains in sea shocks is that they induce a very specific chemistry in sea shocks. Uh, there is this ion, uh, this drift between the ions and the neutrals uh, creates impacts, like heavy neutrals will impact on the dust grains and they will sputter. Uh, ice metals, the species, the organic species, which are on ice metals, the molecular species. And they will release them in the gas phase. And so um, if, you, if you run, uh, this, this shock is running, for example, in a dark cloud, cold dark cloud with ice metals, then uh, you expect that the sea shock will have a lot of uh, water, methanol, uh, ammonia, uh, formaldehyde, release in the, in, the, in the gas phase. And this will show up as a, uh, a very specific chemistry uh, of sea shocks. Um, there is also, if, uh, if the drift uh, velocity is large enough, you can even uh, sputter the grain cores, uh, like uh, silicon can be also released in the gas phase and can react uh, with OH and O2 to form SIO. Uh, and that SIO is, is, is a, is a well-known shock tracer because of that. Uh, although, and there is also SIO released from J-shocks uh, by grain-grain uh, collisions. Um, this is not included in the public code version, but there are, I, I direct you, if you're interested, to these two papers, which um, uh, describe that in detail. So, um, we see that uh, there is quite complicated uh, grain physics to take into account if we want to treat properly the, the chemistry of these, uh, of these dusty uh, molecular shocks. Then uh, the final uh, um, yeah, improvement that uh, the most recent that has been uh, made to this code by uh, Benjamin Godard is the inclusion of external irradiation by a far UV, uh, far UV uh, interstellar field. So far ultraviolet radiation, uh, like the ambient, uh, the ambient interstellar. The parameter that is typically used is G0, which is one for the solar neighborhood, but can be higher than this if you are closer to, uh, uh, if you have more ionizing stars nearby. And you can also specify uh, some kind of optic of dust attenuation between the source of this radiation and the beginning of the, the shock wave. Uh, the effect of, of adding this irradiation, there are two effects and they go in the same sense. The first one is that it's going to dissociate some of the H2. So it's going to lower the cooling by H2, which is the, the main coolant in these uh, slow shocks. And also it's going to increase the ionization. So it's going to increase the coupling between ions and neutrals. And it's going to, so this is going to make the shock narrower. They are more coupled, the, the, the less drift. And so both of these effects make the shock narrower and hotter because you, you don't have H2 cooling. And eventually uh, the viscous, uh, the neutral-neutral collisions are going to become uh, 
dominant over the ion neutral collisions and you go back to uh, you're going to get a, a j shock a viscous uh, j shock discontinuity so what benjamin found was that c shocks essentially disappear uh, above a certain uh, g naught and they or they become cj again they, they become a hybrid uh, uh, and there are some specific diagnostics of these uh, irradiated shocks, for example, CH plus, uh, or aberration, or H2. It's, it's really, it's important if you want to model shocks in irradiated environments like the diffuse gas uh, at galactic scale, for example, where, you know, not dense dark clouds, uh, where the AV is very large, but regions that are less uh, protected. So this is just, just a quick summary of the effects uh, the effect of, of G naught. So this is just uh, as a function of G naught, the separation between C and J. This curve here is the magnetosonic speed that I talked about earlier. Um, and actually, when when G naught increases, for the reasons I I, know, I told you, the shocks become narrower, and so the C shock goes through a subsonic transition, and then you get a CJ in this region. You also have that when you have small magnetic field. Oops, small magnetic fields. Yeah, you again get this narrow shock uh, problem. Um, on the high speed, uh, something I didn't note didn't notice that eventually you you lose the C shocks because of a collision or dissociation of H two, but that's at about a hundred kilometers per second. So. Even if you increase magnetic field, you increase the magnetosonic speed, which is the solid line, eventually you hit this uh, dissociation limit. Uh, and these are just small effects of ice matter. So now I'm going to go uh, into, so I have one hour left. I'm going to go into the backward modeling, but um, I don't know, maybe if there are some questions on the theoretical, the forward modeling, the, the shock models, do you think that... Uh... Yeah, 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 there are a bunch of questions. You may take them now. So first question is about the definition of your of the gamma in your equation. Is it the adiabatic index? Yes, it's the adiabatic index. Okay, good. <laughs> I can ever... remember the name in English, so... No, yes, yeah, no, adiabatic, no, adiabatic index. index. Fine. <laughs> so your CV is fine. Um, one question is, are there any effort to port the Paris Durham shock code to newer libraries? As many systems will have significant trouble to run Python 2.7 and PyQt4. Mm. Okay, I cannot answer this question, but uh, maybe um, I will ask the question to Benjamin, who is the main developer on the code. Okay, um, next question is on slide 16. Uh, the presented calculation assume a magnetic field about 15 microgauss. What is the choice of which the one is a slide 16? I don't have the slide numbers here. I mean, either <laughs> which one? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going through the slides, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you assume a, a magnetic field of 15 microgauss, and what is the choice value based on? Where do I assume 15 microgauss? I can't tell you. I can tell you. Oh, here, this one, 15 microgauss. Exactly, yes. Okay, uh, this is just an example. Uh, and this corresponds to a uh, little b of 0.5. So if you do b divided by, in microgauss, divided by square root of uh, n, mm -hmm. not, that's little b, so the, the, the parameterization. So 0.5 is, uh, you know, it's close to one. It's typically what uh, is observed in interstellar medium if you, if you plot okay. B versus N. So it's typical value. Yeah. And the last question is about the erosion and sputtering of grain cores. Okay. How, how come you, of, you uh, observe SIO only as, uh, as well, silicate is SIO4, so you should see SIO4, SIO3, SIO2, SIO, mm. SI, in a decreasing abundance. That's a very good question. I mean, all, these are all very good questions. Um, thank you for listening so carefully. Um, I, I, I was uh, wondering the same questions when I was starting to work on this. So uh, 
uh, actually what happens with the sputtering is that uh, you remove atoms per atom. It's, it's a, well, it's not, it's supposed to be amorphous uh, silicates, but uh, I wonder if the, the yields, so they make uh, this, the, the yields come from, um, I don't remember the name of the code, a code that models the impact of, uh, of heavy atoms onto a substrate. Simeon. Which one? I don't know, Simeon maybe? No. Yeah, another one, but yeah, probably the same kind. Mm. And so they measure the, the yields and you extract atom per atom. But, uh, so then you extract silicon separately, oxygen separately, iron, magnesium, whatever the composition of your silicate is. Um, but the yields depend on the type of crystal or the type of, uh, of, of uh, mineralogy of your grains. Uh, on the other hand, grain-grain vaporization, which is the what happens in grain-grain collisions. Grain-grain collisions are much more energetic, of course, and they can melt a piece of the grain. And then a piece of the grain just vaporizes. And, and in that case, yes, you can get directly SIO or SIO something into the gas phase. And I don't know why um, Vincent Guillet uh, assumes that it's SIO. There must be a good reason. But I don't know. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, maybe have a look at his paper. So it's mm. Guillet 2009, and uh, he probably discusses it there. But okay. it's an excellent question. Okay, so there is no more question for this okay. part. So now I'm going to go to the backward modeling. Oh, yeah, I have an idea for SIO. It's because SiO is a stable molecule, whereas uh, SiO4 is not. Uh, SiO4 is stable and SiO2 is silica, silica, it's stable also. SiO4 is stable? Yeah, it's silicate and SiO2 yeah, is silica. Yeah, in silicate form, but in gas form. I don't know. I don't think you can have a... Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert. Uh, maybe some PCMI expert can tell us, but I think you can form SiO2 and SIO, but not SIO4 in gas phase. Okay, we'll see. Okay. Um, anyway, so now the backward modeling, which is you know what we all want to do uh, often is to just, we have observations and we would like to know which type of shock we're looking at and how much, uh, what we can deduce about uh, all the questions I know, the, you know, the piston, the wind, the feedback and et cetera. The problem, as you can see from what I showed you, is that there are many free parameters in uh, shocks. And so there is some degeneracy. Uh, there's not just uh, density, uh, velocity, and magnetic field, but there is also the age. There is also the irradiation. There is the ice composition. Um, so yeah, so ideally, um, uh, you want to combine as many constraints as possible. That's the, 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 the bottom uh, message. Uh, because if you use only one of these diagnostics, each of them has a problem. For example, if you want to use just absolute line fluxes predicted from the models, then there is a feeling factor uh, uncertainty. And also, you're not sure um, how much of, of your species are still on the ice, how much are on the grain, how much are in the gas phase. So um, if you use line ratios, it's better because it's just the relative depletion, the feeling factor cancels out. But still, um, if you use different species, uh, they may have different degrees of depletion. So, uh, you can use single the sing, line ratios of a single species or maybe undepleted species like, like neon, for example. Neon and oxygen uh, are very little depleted. So you could use ratios of those. Uh, but then I'm going to show you that there are also um, things we may not think about initially, but are very interesting constraints, which are the, the shock thickness. Because I showed you that C shocks are very thick compared to J shocks. So in principle, if you have sufficiently high resolution, you should be able to resolve the, the precursor of the C-shock. Uh, and that is, um, uh, Hubble is not maybe the best because it's, it's optical, so you don't see the molecular emission of these C-shocks, but 
uh, JWST is going to be capable maybe of, of doing that. And ALMA in, uh, in some other tracers uh, can give us also some, some important uh, information. The line profile width is very important because it can give you information on the shock speed. Uh, you expect it to be close to the shock speed within a cosine term. And I'm going to show you how you can uh, do that with 2D bow shocks where the inclination effects are a bit less uh, dramatic. Ortho para of H2, uh, which I, I didn't mention before because it's, it's a bit complex, but uh, you can have, uh, you have two kinds of, of H2 molecules and uh, somewhere the, the, the spins of the two uh, H atoms are, the two uh, protons are aligned, somewhere they are anti-parallel and they cannot convert into each other unless they have collisions with protons or H. And so this can happen in the shocks, in the C-shocks. And so if you can uh, observe different, different positions of a C-shock or if you, especially if you can observe this as a function of velocity, uh, I will show you that it, it can be very constraining. Um, if you, the best also very important, uh, you can have uh, best situation is, is if you can also have constraints on like ambient density, G naught, AV, uh, ionization. I didn't talk about these two parameters, but they're also very important for the pre-shock um, conditions is the ionizing uh, rate by cosmic rays and X-rays, which is can modify uh, the amount of uh, molecular H2 that you have in your pre-shock. Uh, maybe you can, if you can have constraints on that from uh, independent data, that is going to be very useful for your modeling. And then for the shock age, uh, again, you also can also have some independent constraints from let's say the speed and the size or the distance from the star and the, the speed. So the idea is to, to try to have something as consistent as possible. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example of, of modeling that has been done by, uh, by Cham uh, Lengok uh, uh, on uh, the Orion H2. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a generic uh, work, but it's, it's trying to model bow shocks. So why bow shocks? What is a bow shock? It's, it's um, what we expect in young stars when there is not a, a spherical wind, but a jet. And the jet is, is, is going to shock against the ambient medium. Um, the propagation speed of the shock is going to be basically the same as for a shell, but the, the compressed gas here is going to escape on the sides and in the frame of the shock, it's going to feel a backwards wind, a headwind from the, the ambient gas. In the frame of the shock, the ambient gas is coming into the shock, okay? Uh, so it's like sweeping back uh, this, this, this high pressure material and it's producing these curved uh, wings uh, shocks, curved shocks we call bow shock wings. And you can see these shocks are very oblique because uh, the parallel component doesn't create a shock. It's just the material just slides along the surface. So the shock speed is just the perpendicular component here. And you can see that as you go into the wings, uh, the perpendicular component is going to be less and less. So you're, you're going to have a whole range of shock speeds along this surface. And you can actually compute how much of, of each shock speed you're going to have. And you can build um, what we call H2 excitation diagrams. So maybe I should uh, spend a bit of time on this uh, the, or not too much because I don't have much time left, but um, H2 excitation diagram is uh, from each uh, H2 line that you, molecular H2 line, you can, it's optically thin line, so you can deduce the column density. From the intensity, you can deduce the column density in each upper level of the line. Uh, so for each line, you have a point here and you plot this upper level column density as a function of the energy of the upper level. And uh, we use it because usually it makes something, something smooth. Whereas if you plot intensities, it's all over the place because the Einstein coefficients are different. And what is interesting is then to, to look at what these bow shocks uh, 
look like in this type of excitation diagrams and to see if you can uh, constrain some of the shock parameters. For example, here, clearly the density, the free shock density has a huge effect on the excitation diagram. There's also an effect of age here, which is uh, different from the density. Uh, I don't show it, but there is also an effect of the B field uh, strength and, and angle with respect to the bow axis. So these diagrams are, have very good diagnostic potential. What is interesting also is, um, yeah, I'm not showing it, but um, there is not a strong effect of the bow, uh, the velocity at which the bow shock propagates because we are dominated by the flanks, the wings of the bow shock. So basically it looks like a, a 10 kilometer per second shock mostly, uh, although with some curvature. Um, and you have to be careful that, uh, so you have to be careful not to impose if you, if you know the velocity of your bow shock and say, okay, I know it's a bow shock that goes at uh, 50 kilometers per second. So I want to fit it with a, a shock model at 50. Uh, no, it, you're going to find a very strong magnetic field because uh, in fact, you are not dominated by the, the head of the bow. You're dominated by the, the wings of the bow at low velocity. So um, when you fit, uh, when you let the velocity free, then you get the, the right magnetic field. So this is an example of fitting uh, in Orion Peak 1. Maybe I should first show you the image of Orion Peak 1 because it's a very nice <laughs> region. It's the brightest source in the sky for H2 emission, molecular H2 emission. This is an image from um, in a raw vibrational line of H2 at 2 micron. And at the center, there is a, a massive star. In fact, there is a system of several massive stars that uh, probably uh, have gone through a very close interaction and then have um, um, have recoiled. Um, and peak one is the brightest uh, region here. So there are um, many data on this region, of course. Uh, this is the excitation diagram, the observational data is in black. And uh, you can see that before there were using several shock speeds, but this, uh, the best fit for with a bow shock is in white. So just with a single bow shock, we can fit all of these data and uh, Cham managed to, to constrain the density very well, 10 to the six, the age, 1000 years, which interestingly is the age of the, this interaction between the stars in the center. It's the age of this eruptive outflow. Uh, the little b parameter, a magnetic parameter. And, but he could not uh, constrain the, the, the velocity of the bow shock because anything above 30 gives the same result. Now, if you add, to leave the degeneracy, if you add line profile information, uh, this is a line profile that was observed by uh, Grant, and, and you try to fit with bow shocks, you see with 30, you don't reproduce the width of the line you need to go basically to, to 90 or almost 100 kilometers per second to fit the, the, the width of the line. And it's interesting because uh, this is the velocity that you measure for those fingers, what we call them fingers, all these uh, beautiful things here. At the tip of the fingers, there is a, a knot of emission in R2 and we can measure the proper motion and it's close to 100 kilometers per second. Um, also, uh, to illustrate the usefulness of the high angular resolution, so this, the, what I showed you before is just uh, a model where the whole bow shock is, is, is summed together. But what happens if you could resolve these bow shocks? So here I'm showing uh, a zoom on one little bow shock here, which was observed uh, with adaptive optics from the ground with a 0.15 arc second resolution, which is pretty good. And also it was flux calibrated, which was also very useful. Um, and if, uh, and you can see that the, 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 the bow walls are resolved in thickness. Uh, and so Lars Christensen made cuts through these bow shock walls and he tried to fit at the same time the flux and the thickness. And uh, he concluded that he needed C shocks with uh, quite a large little B of, of about five, I think. Uh, and then there was also, um, this was assuming that we were seeing everything at John. Then there was a, 
a 3D model taking into account projection effects with, uh, by Mike Gustafsson. Uh, on the right, you can see the image, the synthetic image that reproduced the observations. And she found the same, basically the same results. And it's the same, very close parameters to what uh, Chen found, just from the line profile and the excitation diagram. So uh, to me, this is one of the strongest uh, evidence for sea shocks uh, that we have uh, right now in the sky. And it's, it's showing that if you combine several observational constraints like uh, sizes and fluxes or uh, line profiles and excitation diagrams, you can really go uh, quite far in the modeling. Now I'm, I'm going to show you an example of the use of the ortho power ratio. So uh, again, uh, uh, how to describe this. So the ortho H2 is the one with the aligned spins of the, of the two, uh, two protons, and it can only have uh, J, odd, odd values of J. So these two lines, S of seven and S of five, oops, the purple and the green, are lines of, from ortho H2. And the blue and the red, SO4 and SO6, are lines of para H2. And you see that there is a, a slight velocity shift between the ortho and the para, the odd J and the even J lines. And you can actually uh, plot that differently. You can plot, compute the ortho para ratio as a function of velocity. Oh, I forgot to say that these line profiles are uh, obtained by a, a relatively new instrument called XS on SOFIA um, that uh, can do uh, velocity resolved observations in the mid infrared. So these are these lines are between five and mm, what uh, eight micron, I think. Um, and HH seven is is a bow shock again, a bow shock driven by Loma star this time. So this is what the ortho power ratio looks like as a function of velocity across the line profile. And this is what the uh, excitation temperature, so just if you do the ratio of two ortho lines or two para lines uh, from different levels, you can, you can, you can fit uh, an excitation temperature, a rotational temperature. And you can see that the rotational temperature doesn't change much, but the ortho power changes a lot. And that can only be explained by a C shock. You cannot do it with J shocks. So again, that's uh, another very nice uh, indication of for C shocks, and you can try to model it with a Paris-Durham shock model. And these are the the models, the curves here, uh, which uh, Cham and uh, Pierre Lesaf uh, uh, made. Uh, it's a very nice fit um, for this uh, this shock model. Um, then I will uh, briefly go through um, other molecules because, okay, there is H2, which JWST is going to provide plenty of information on. So what I just showed you is nothing compared to what we're going to do with JWST. But uh, there are also other molecules that uh, emit in, uh, in C-shocks or non-dissociative shocks and that are very useful uh, indicators of uh, the shock physics and C versus J, uh, in particular CO. So here I'm giving a list of papers that you may want to have a look at if you're interested by these other molecules, uh, like CO, water, methanol, uh, ammonia, OH. Uh, all of these molecules, um, the chemistry is included in the shock, but also the uh, uh, LVG, so large velocity gradient, uh, uh, excitation of the lines because these are optically thick lines generally so it's not as easy as H2 you need to to, to do in principle you should do the line transfer um, properly uh, for the line excitation it's okay to, to, to use the LVG uh, and then uh, to do the emi emitted line profiles you need to be a bit more careful so I'm not going to show it now but um, uh, Cham uh, has and, and Benjamin have developed uh, a tool to produce uh, to produce line profiles in these optimistic lines that we hope we can put on the website uh, uh, relatively soon. 
So what is interesting in these, um, so some of them are just, uh, you know, just ice species like uh, methanol, for example. So you can just, uh, but the line ratios are dependent on the density. Uh, they have some pretty high critical density for methanol. So this is a good, a good information, or water also has very high critical density. So from the line ratios, uh, of different lines of the same molecule, you can, you can get very interesting information of the, on the density in the shock. Um, also, you can get uh, C versus J diagnostics. This is an example of, uh, for example, uh, C and J shocks, uh, the line intensities in different lines. Uh, and you can see that some of them have huge differences like oxygen one, of course, is, a, is a clearly a tracer of, of J shocks. Um, OH is also much stronger in J shocks. NH3, it's the opposite. It's destroyed in J shocks by uh, atomic H. So uh, you can see again that if you can combine um, several lines, several species, uh, you can be able to, to constrain. Uh, very well the, uh, the shock uh, parameters. This is an example of a, a very nice study uh, by Flora and Pinot de Forêt in 2013 in IRS Forêt, which is a, an outro source that was studied uh, with Herschel with PACS. And so they had lots of lines in the infrared, high JCO, uh, water lines, OH lines. And, and you can see that they, they managed to, to feed the data um, and they actually needed two shocks, a C and a J shock to, to fit the data. Um, this double shock structure is, uh, is something that we actually expect. Uh, I showed you before, there is the reverse shock and the forward shock. Um, in the case of young protostars, we even expect, as I if the ambient medium is dense, uh, I told you that uh, we know that the, the velocity at which the shell moves forward is quite slow, maybe 10, 20 kilometers per second. So you expect the forward shock to be a C shock and the, the reverse shock of if the wind is going at 100 and, and, and suffers um, and then slows down to 20, it's suffering an 80 kilometer per second jump. So the reverse shock should be a J shock. So we do expect to have combinations of C plus J. That makes things a bit more complicated unless you can do, uh, as I showed you, unless you can, you have enough tracers to, to, to separate uh, each component. Uh, I'm going then briefly to mention um, another um, technique to, to, to model uh, shocks, not just not to try to get the detailed shock parameters uh, like we did, I showed you before, the density, the velocity, et cetera, but just to get uh, an idea of the global feedback on the cloud. And this is, uh, some people call it the bolometric method. The idea is that, okay, um, if we can find a tracer that is the main coolant uh, of the shock and radiates most of the kinetic energy flux, then uh, we don't need to know exactly the density, the velocity of the shock. We just need to measure the luminosity of that tracer. And then we get uh, the flux of uh, kinetic energy into the shock. And that's what we want to have. So here I'm showing you, oh, I forgot to put the reference, but this table comes from another paper by Flora and Pinot de Forêt, 2010. And they're showing the percentage of the kinetic energy flux into the shock, half, one half of rho v cubed, that is radiated by different shock tracers. And that's for different pre-shock densities, different shock speeds, uh, C-type and J-type. And these are for B equal one, B equal 0.1. So it's a specific magnetic field. Um, and you can, you can quickly see that H2 uh, is really the dominant coolant uh, for the low shock, uh, for all of the C-shocks, the slow, slow C-shocks, and also for the slow J-shocks. Uh, until you start to dissociate, uh, it's basically it's the dominant coolant. Uh, there is a variation uh, from of this percentage from let's say twenty five to eighty percent, but uh, okay, it's a factor of three. Uh, it's not so bad. Uh, 
And if you add, pardon, 15 uh, minutes? Yeah, 15 minutes. Oh, OK. Moi, j'ai que 5h05. Euh, je finis pas à 5h30? Avec les questions. Ah oui, OK. Ah, excuse-moi. Non, 5h20. OK, OK, OK. Sorry, 5 heures, for... 5 heures, yes. OK, OK. Uh, okay, so um, so the idea is that by measuring the H2 luminosity, we can get within a factor of three the kinetic energy flux uh, entering the shocks. Now you see that when the shock starts to be dissociative, which is uh, roughly uh, 30, uh, 20, 30 kilometers per second in J shocks, the H2 emission, of course, disappears. And what comes up? Mm -hmm, okay. Uh, is the Lyman alpha emission uh, from hydrogen. And there is also the oxygen one that I noted before that comes up. So these will be uh, interesting tracers for the dissociative J shock. So the bolometric method applied uh, in H2. Um, there was a, a very nice study by Mare uh, et al. in 2009 of this region, NGC 1333, which is a cluster of young stars. It's a cloud that uh, has many outflows. All of the green stuff that you see here is outflows, H2 emission from outflows. And you can see they crisscross each other all over the cloud. Um, this one is the most powerful, but they're all over the place. Um, and so the, uh, and the, the, the excitation diagram of H2 is compatible with sea shocks at 20, 30 kilometers per second. Um, from the H2 luminosity, you can get the kinetic energy flux. And from that, you can, if you divide by the shock speed, you can get the momentum energy in injection rate. Why do we do the momentum? Because that's the conserved quantity. The kinetic energy uh, injected is dissipated uh, radiatively. And uh, if we want to know how much of that is going to stay in the form of turbulence, we prefer to look at the momentum, which is conserved. And from this calculation, you see that after uh, 2, 10 to the 5 years, which is typically the age, the duration of the uh, protostellar phase, each flow imparts uh, a turbulence of 1 kilometer per second in, in five solar masses. So if you have 20 flows, which is roughly the number of flows here, you can uh, inject turbulence in 100 solar masses, which is about 30% of the cloud mass. So it's really not a negligible effect on the, on the cloud. Um, something else for the bolometric method is for dissociative shocks. So uh, again, I showed you here that when the shock becomes dissociative, you start to have O1 and Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha, of course, is absorbed by the dust, so we'll never observe it, unfortunately. So we have to rely on trace you know, less, uh, less bright uh, lines, but oxygen one is a very good one. And the interesting thing about O1 is that uh, it was noted by Hollenbach that the flux of O1 is proportional not to the mechanical luminosity, but to the mass flux uh, through the shock. And uh, I can explain this to you later if you want, but uh, it's, uh, it's been used, uh, heavily used to compute uh, mass fluxes. Uh, you can do the same with iron two and silicon, provided you know the depletion, which usually is not the case. So uh, I'm a bit dubious. Uh, I mean, this is just empirical for those two here. It's empirical on on this on on the alphas in NGC thirteen thirty three. Um, but there are limitations with this polymetric method for O1. And uh, the limitation is that actually several shock fonts contribute to O1. Uh, here, uh, when they do M dot wind, so the mass flux of the wind, they assume that we are just looking at this uh, reverse shock where the wind is stopped. And so what we measure is essentially the mass flux into the wind. But in reality, there are shocks all along the jet um, until the, the reverse, the terminal shock. Um, this is, for example, you can see that in the O1 profile obtained by Sophia, by uh, Antoine Gusdorf, there are several velocity components uh, at different velocities. And so the total luminosity here is not just uh, the terminal shock, which uh, should be at low velocities. 
so it's going to be very important uh, to separate, to use at, at the same time spectral and spatially resolved observations if we want to use these photometric methods. And uh, yeah, we, we cannot just uh, lump it all together. So here are my conclusions. Uh, interstellar shock waves are highly complex systems to model, but they are very detailed uh, 1D models that are public and that exist for different shock regimes. Uh, the backward inversion, so trying from observations to get the shock uh, parameters is a difficult exercise. Um, you have to be careful. Uh, many free parameters, so degeneracies, so you need to combine constraints. Uh, some of the key atomic coolants like uh, iron, uh, sulfur, silicon may have rain depletion and we don't know exactly how much. Uh, so be aware of that. Uh, in the non-dissociative shocks, uh, all of the output radiation depends on the pre-shock chemical conditions, the ice mantles, the uh, ambient uh, irradiation. So you have to be very careful to use self-consistent pre-shock conditions before running the models uh, to adapt these pre-shock conditions to your particular case. And then we may have several shock fronts in the beam, uh, at least a reverse and forward one, or we can have a bow shock, or we can have um, yeah, you know, all kinds of, of situations. So uh, we are going to, it's going to be very helpful to have high angular resolution and spectral resolution. And you are very lucky that JWST and Sophia are, com are soon in the, JWST is coming soon, and Sophia and Alma are already helping us tremendously in that. And finally, last but not least, I don't have slides about it, but there is a huge progress also in the, in the numerical simulations that are now starting to include uh, non-equilibrium chemistry. And that's going also to be a very new powerful tool to interpret observations. Thank you. Thank you. So there are, there are a lot of questions. So I tried to make uh, categories of questions. So the first question is, can this code be applied when observing and modeling the ISM in external galaxies? for example, in merging system or in AGN? Okay, so um, it depends on the uh, shock speed that you have. As I said, there is um, the limitation of this. In principle, yes, if you are in the right regime. So um, it depends. This code doesn't handle the, the radiation uh, precursor and doesn't handle the far UV, the Lyman alpha transfers through the shock wave. I should have written it, but. So here, for example, uh, in this dissociative shock, you see there is UV production here, and this is absorbed downstream in the gas. We don't have that in the Paris Durham shock code. Okay, that's why we limit ourselves to below 30, 40 kilometers per second. There is a new version of the code that includes this transfer. Uh, the paper is going to come out uh, very soon. I don't know if it's going to be made public immediately, but um, uh, maybe uh, you can contact me and I can put you in touch with uh, the people who do this if you are interested in uh, trying to increase the, the shock speed uh, above 30 up to 40, 50. Otherwise, um, yeah, the best is either this or the mappings code, but the mappings code has no molecules. No. So if you are observing H2, molecular H2, you can use it. So, uh, and unfortunately, the, this one, the Hollenbach and Mackey is not public. So we are trying uh, to, to, to reach into the regime of Hollenbach and Mackey, but right now we are maybe up to 50 kilometers per second. And it's a lot of work. Okay. So to stay in the modeling of external galaxies, are, the specific, are there specific trust tracer or quantities of shock, kinetic energy flux, as a function of star formation rate? Should we expect specific types of shock in dusty molecular gas-rich ISFR galaxies, for instance, as the extreme example? Um, 
So dusty, ISF. Yeah. Uh, so are, are there specific tracer of shocks as a function of star formation rate? As a function of star formation rate. Yes. So I guess this is really maybe the best example would be. Oh, it depends which kind of star formation you're talking about. But uh, this one, this is an active star formation region in our galaxy, but it's a low mass star formation region. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, yes, there is H2, uh, very strong H2 emission um, from, these, uh, from these alpha shocks. If you, in the case of massive star formation regions, uh, you also have, of course, uh, outflows. And you also have, again, if the, the material is dense enough and if the shock slows down to 20, 30 kilometers per second, you're also going to get a lot of H2 uh, emission. Now, so the, the question- So the tracer is H2 emission? No, not just H. I mean, you have different kinds of tracers. The, the nice thing about H2 is that it's, it's the main coolant. So you can, uh, you can get the yeah. kinetic energy flux, but uh, then you also have um, all these other shock diagnostics, for example, oxygen one line, but then it, you also have PDRs. So you need to have at least some velocity information to distinguish. Mm. It's, it's a whole subject to distinguish between shocks and PDRs. Uh, mm. the, the line ratios are very important to distinguish between shocks and PDRs. Um, you can have SIO. SIO is usually a, a good shock, uh, a good shock, and then the ice species usually also are um, uh, very nice uh, tracers of shocks. Mm. Ice species. Uh, so, um, species. Uh, SIO. And then H2, but a specific excitation of H2. So I'm not a, I'm not an expert in uh, PDR models, but maybe Eric, uh, Eric, uh, Emric, Emric. Emric, uh, can uh, tell us uh, what would be the best uh, discriminant between uh, shocks and uh, PDR and PDRs in H2. Okay. Um, so next question. So you briefly mentioned uh, polarization. What kind of polarization effect do you have? Ah, polarization, uh, when I compare. Of the dust, of the dust, yeah. Yes, here, and polarization data. This exactly. was not my data. Uh, it's actually, it's totally independent. It's Zeman uh, measurements oh. uh, by Crutcher in the same region. And uh, also dust polarization, uh, you know, from the... Um, Oh, the dispersion of angles in the dust polarization, you can also try to estimate uh, the magnetic field intensity. Okay. So it's not from the H2. So one question about H2. Um, does the reformation of H2 in the post-shock happens on dust or in the gas phase? Hey, excellent question. Yeah, that's the Jérôme question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all excellent questions. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, blow up. Uh, I didn't. I didn't prepare a slide on that. Maybe I should have. It starts in the gas phase through the uh, H minus. Uh, so process. you ion you ionize it. Yeah, because you have some electrons in when when you're still ionized. You have some H minus and you can form H2 through the H minus uh, process. And three body, I guess. Yeah, three body. Uh, three body if you're dense enough. But uh, I think in the, in the Holland back and Mackey paper, they mentioned more the H minus process. And then on dust, but dust is a, it's a bit slower, of course. So it's both. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then I have a series of questions on the auto para ratio. Mm -hmm. So why H2S5 and the seven lines are broader and more asymmetric than S4 and S6? Good questions. I'm not sure. I think it means there is uh, there may be uh, a different shock here uh, that has an even has a higher auto para ratio. 
it's it's causing uh, this part here yeah it's basically this uh this increase here which is steeper than in in our model so i i don't really know i think i think uh, our model is it, this one is only a 1d shock it's not even a bow shock okay. Okay. so we haven't looked into this in detail yet but uh, I suspect that if we could make some curvature or maybe add a, a second shock, uh, it would. Uh, fix. Okay. So, do you see uh, autopara ratio in other molecules like formaldehyde, water, ammonia, and mm. similar velocity shifts? Mm -hmm. And similar velocity fields? Shifts, uh, sim shifts. Similar ah. velocity shifts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I never wondered about that. There, there are definitely ortho and, and para water lines, but I don't think we have seen shifts and I'm not sure we would... Uh, for ortho to para water... Or ammonia maybe. Yeah, or also to para ammonia. Uh, do we expect to see the conversion? Is I, I don't know about the conversion rates for these molecules. So I, I don't know if you expect to have, uh, because here what happens, what makes the change of ortho para as a function of velocity, I should have explained it, is that- um, Yeah, that's the next question actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I realized I should have explained it. We start, and I forgot to write the initial ortho para ratio, which is a basic uh, parameter yeah. of the model. We start yeah, the temperature. From, from a low ortho para ratio, mm -hmm. because in a cold gas, uh, you can, uh, the, everything could be in the para state, in fact, mm. pretty much. But in this case, we need to start from, yeah, almost zero, everything in the para state. And then as the gas slows down, uh, it, it warms up. And uh, at 20 kilometer per second, there is some slight uh, dissociation of, of H2 into H and the H uh, substitutions create an ortho para exchange. And because the gas becomes warm, the, uh, it tends to the equilibrium ortho para ratio at high temperature, which is three. It doesn't have time to reach it because uh, then it cools down again. It just it tries, tries to go up. Maybe if we could make it. Uh, <laughs> so, so why does it have to be in a C shock? That's the question. Okay, because uh, in J shocks, so in J shocks, naively, I was expecting it to be even more efficient in J shocks because you have more H, you have more dissociation, mm -hmm. but they are very short. Remember, the the time is very short, so you don't actually you don't have time to do much conversion in J-shocks. Mm. You can do a little bit of it, but uh, not, as, not as fast. And um, you to, 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 to get this range of ortho power ratio, uh, such a huge range, you cannot get such a huge change within a single J-shock. So you would need to have uh, many different J-shocks at different velocities. Uh, and then you would expect to see a gradient also in the excitation temperature would vary with the velocity, but we don't see that. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. All right, so maybe we can stop here and go to the coffee room so you can directly interact with Sylvie. Okay. So meet you there. Uh, did you send me the link? You have, it, the... you have it in the chat, yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you.